Calling all Swifties and champions of change, Like a Girl Media is rolling out the red carpet for you with our Thrive Like a Girl contest. We're all about celebrating powerful women leaders who inspire us to dream big and push boundaries. And who embodies that spirit more than Taylor Swift herself? Here's your chance to see her live in concert. We're giving away two tickets to Taylor Swift's show in London on Saturday, June 22nd. Imagine being part of the magic, all thanks to Like a Girl Media. Entering is easy. Subscribe, share, and show us which episodes inspired you the most. Visit our website or check our social media for all the details. Don't just dream it, be it. Thrive like a girl and make this summer unforgettable. Contest opens globally, void where prohibited, must be 18 or older to enter, no purchase necessary. Subscribe and share with hashtag thrive like a girl and tag us at like a girl underscore media for entry. Unlimited entries means unlimited chances. Winner chosen at random after contest closes May 20th, 2024. We'll be notified via DM. Make sure your profiles are not private. Check full rules on our site. This is your shot to see Taylor Swift live. Don't miss it. Welcome to the High Tea with Grace podcast, where we spill the tea on HIT. Today, I'm honored to welcome Stacey Johnson, Dr. Vice President, Chief Applications Officer at Baptist Health in Florida. Thanks for joining us, Stacey. You're welcome. Thank you so much for asking me. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the career path that brought to you to where you are now at Baptist Health. Sure. So I'm actually a physician by background. And when you go to medical school, you do not think, hey, I want to be a healthcare leader or I want to be in IT or technology. And so ultimately during residency, it was transition from paper to electronic. And at that time, I was a super user and a lot of the residents were the ones leading the head of the implementation. And then so by the time I graduated from residency and I went to become on an attending, I was the only one at that healthcare organization that had done any sort of electronic order entry. So next thing I know, I'm the chief medical information officer very shortly out of residency. And so I led up our implementation from paper to electronic at the smaller community hospital where I was before at Beaufort Memorial in Beaufort, South Carolina. And so at that time, I was also a full-time hospitalist and medical director of the hospitalist program. So it was pretty busy. And next thing I know, Baptist had reached out to me and said, hey, we are looking for someone to become our CMIO when the CMIO retires. And they said, it's a job and training. You're going to come in as the associate CMIO, but we're looking for someone that's a hospitalist, someone that has their master's degree, and someone that's a current sitting CMIO. And I said, I have all those things. And so they said, yep, you, we think you would be a perfect fit. And so I, I came in and uh, was the associate CMIO for a period of time. During that time, I learned a lot about the organization. This, of course, was a much bigger organization had more services. They really wanted someone that came in as a half physician, half administration, so that I really got to be boots on the ground, really got to know the physician leadership, the other physicians. So I was spending half of my time as a hospitalist and then the other half as in the IT world. I really enjoyed getting to know the physicians. And I just really felt like Baptist was this great place where I could see living forever and finishing out my career. And so then As I mentioned, it was on the job training, but it was also like an everyday audition. Fortunately, they did say, yes, we want to move forward with you becoming our CMIO. And so the ongoing joke is I became the CMIO on November 1st. And on November 2nd, we decided to move to Epic. (laughs) And so it was a huge honor. They asked me to head up the Epic implementation and I loved every minute. It was fun and stressful and exciting and leading this amazing transformational change at this amazing organization. And we just, I got to meet so many people and work with so many wonderful people. We had, I think over 1100 people, team members participate in the build. So I was working with nurses, pharmacists, clinical staff, non-clinical staff, revenue cycle, administration, physicians, nurses. So I really got to know a lot of people. But then uh, all of this was happening actually during COVID. So we were doing a lot of this remotely, which gave me a chance to uh, really allowed for us to have a lot more people involved in the implementation just because, again, we're remote. So 
our patient experience committee had 95 people sitting on it. So I, I had a, a lot of great exposure to so many people within the organization. And then as we were wrapping that up, I was given the opportunity, do you want to go and resume the role of CMIO? And I thought, you know what? I've really enjoyed leading up the technology aspects. And so mm-hmm. We all know was, that. We all know I that. Know. <laughs> exactly. And I said, so what is this? What can I do here? And they said, we've never really had an applications department. Our applications were all kind of reporting to multiple different areas. And so I got to build an entire department. And so I built the applications department and they created the chief applications role for me. And so it was a lateral move, the vice president and chief applications officer. And it allowed for me to bridge between clinical and technology. I sit in CIO councils, I sit in CMIO councils, and I wear the hats of both. And we do have a CMIO and she's amazing to work with. And we have a really great partnership. And of course we have a CIO, he's our CDIO and I work really well with him as well too. But this is a nice, this is something new. It's something different. And I've just loved every minute of it. What a dream job in a dream place too. (laughs) Like just so beautiful with the dolphins and the water. And so tell me a little bit about Baptist Health. What is the makeup of Baptist Health? Who are you serving? Yeah, so we are a regional location um, within Jacksonville, Florida. We do actually serve into Georgia as well, too. We have six hospitals. We bucket them into community hospitals or tertiary care center and then a, a nationally renowned and ranked pediatric hospital. We also have a partnership with uh, the MD Anderson Cancer Institute. And so we have a Baptist MD Anderson. So we have nationally renowned, world renowned cancer care. And so we have patients that are reaching as far as four hours away to receive their cancer care and same thing with their pediatric care. So we, even though we are, some people consider us to be a community hospital, I consider us to be so much more. Uh, We do have a teaching component for our pediatric um, population. So we have residents in the pediatric hospital. So we're a, a little bit beyond a community hospital and, but not quite academic. And so we have this nice mix of that community-based, locally owned, locally governed. So we really are the heart of Jacksonville. So if you ever go to a Jaguars game, you'll see Baptist up on the sign there. Baptist, we are Jacksonville. We bleed it. And we just really just love representing the city of Jacksonville. Mm, I love that. We're a community hospital, but not really because we're so much more. It really is a really interesting thing. So I want to dive into this transition from disparate electronic health records to consolidation. So can you tell me a little bit about the challenges you were facing with all of these different record systems prior to consolidating? And how did these challenges impact patient care, operational efficiency, and other things at that time? And I think you you were saying you were even a physician there too at that time. So what was that like? Yeah. Uh, So I'm a hospitalist by background and training, and I still practice on occasion. So as a hospitalist, we couldn't see the primary care notes. And so we were often working off of prior medication lists. We didn't necessarily have their updated medication lists, their allergies, their immunizations. And was this blood pressure medication stopped for a reason? Was it started for a reason? So losing that core information. And then on the flip side, again, being in in technology, we often heard from our primary care docs, and our outpatient cardiologists, any of our other outpatient services, we don't know what happened during the inpatient stay. I'd like to get the discharge summary. And we were trying to work out this direct send, a direct interface to the inpatient summaries, the discharge summaries. And the medication list would be one medication list on the inpatient side and a different medication list on the ambulatory side. And so at the end of the day, that didn't allow for us to provide the best patient care that we knew we could. We have amazing docs who care about the quality, who care about our patients, but really what we felt was technology was getting in the way of caring for our patients. And so Baptist decided to look at the best way to consolidate um, that patient care journey and really also push it to the limit. So not only bringing in your ambulatory and your inpatient into this single electronic health record, but your revenue cycle components, the ability to pay online, 
also the the patient portal experience. We had a I think a ten percent patient portal usage prior to our go live. And then within six months, we are already at 50% of our patients were already using our patient portal. So just having that better patient experience from end to end, from the time of arrival to the time of discharge to the outpatient follow-up to paying their bill and scheduling appointments, all of that was is our patient journey. And when we decided to consolidate, we decided to move to Epic. And we set out guiding principles and our very first guiding principle is putting the patient and their family first. And to me, that is the core of why we are here. No matter whether you're in environmental services or in healthcare IT or a physician, we all are serving our patients at one form or another. That was important to me. That was our number one guiding principle, our North Star of why we're all here today is to give that better patient experience. And then our second guiding principle was really looking at that caregiver experience, improving the caregiver experience. Uh And so putting technology in the hands of the nurses, making sure that they can do mobile vital signs and integrating the vital signs in real time, electronic scanning of the barcode administration. And so interfacing wherever we can, whenever possible, and looking at that full mobility solution for the physicians and making sure that they have voice recognition capabilities and looking at some of those other capabilities that we were really trying to enhance that caregiver experience. Oh, that just brings tears to my eyes because I know that most caregivers are forgotten in the process. People say that they'll be patient-centered, but it's not really patient-centered if you don't have it patient-centered and caregiver-centered. <laughs> it's, exactly. So that's just the way care works for systems and families and real people. It's about more than the patient, it's about the caregiver too. So I just appreciate that so much. You talked about medication reconciliation and why was that such an important part of the puzzle? And did you use AI to help with that, help with the accuracy and more? What part did that prescriptions medication reconciliation play within this process? Yeah, so our medication reconciliation process has been a journey. And in our prior system, what we realized is we were having a lot of fields where people had a free text in. And one thing that we noted was, I feel like there's something better out there. We also wanted a solution that would do a broader search than just your major pharmacies, looking at some of those mom and pop pharmacies, some of your cash payers. And so we started looking at different solutions of how can we solve for these two issues? One, we aren't getting enough data. And even the data that we're getting, it's a free text field and it's automatically not coming over as discrete data. So it's requiring manual transcription. And we had found a partner that we really liked working with and with Dr. First Solution, and they have something called a smart processor. Basically what we ended up doing was we were talking about doing this in our prior environment, but there's the complexity of change and then change again. We thought, you know what, we'll hold off and just do it all at once. We'll go big bang. We're not only going to go big bang with Epic, but we're going to go big bang with this new medication reconciliation partner. And that allowed for them to continue working on the smart processor. And so when we went live, all of those fields that were manual fields that people had to transcribe into were now 95% filled in. And so but people didn't realize because it's all in the back end. Like you aren't realizing what's AI, what's not AI, what's being filled in. You see what's being filled in, but you're not realizing there's something else outside of Epic doing that work for us in the back end. And so I felt like that was one of our biggest wins because it was such a seamless integration and because we were able to go live with it. And also just the data around having 95% of those, what we call in the pharmacy world, SIG fields, those SIG fields are filled in. And so we did a time study basically from the first seven months of Go Live. So we went live on July 30th, 2022. And in January, we ran our data. We had saved 70 million clicks. And so 70 million fields were filled in. Yes. Yeah, so amazing. So it was just, we saved uh, 22,000 hours of nursing hours, just a lot of time given back. But what people didn't realize because we did it at Go Live is they didn't know that there's something else working in the background to save them time. They all thought it was epic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's amazing that 
so many different applications can work so seamlessly with Epic and that you were yeah. able to think about, think strategically, okay, we're going live with Epic. Let's have a lot of other things go alongside to make sure that people are getting the most money out of what we're doing here. This challenge exactly. of switching, it's like millions of records. We make it the most useful as possible. So what? elaborate a little more on the process now of consolidating yeah. all these millions of medication records and ensuring its accuracy. What was the framework you used when you were doing this? Yeah, so we had a data archiving committee that was led by physicians. We really wanted the EPIC implementation to be physician and clinician led. So we had multiple levels of advisory councils and work groups. And for every work group, we had both a pediatric and adult version of that. Again, having this world-renowned pediatric hospital was important to us that pediatrics sat at the table. And so one of the consolidated work groups was a kind of the data archiving consolidation work group. And how much data are we bringing back? How much are we going to store? What are, how are we going to access the historical records? How long do we keep Cerner and Tetraworks going? All of these decisions were made. And what we settled on was three years of data would be coming in and that we would store in the historical records, our archiving system, anything beyond that. For We had some asterisks. So for colonoscopy, we brought in 10 years worth. And so for our medication list, we brought in the three years worth. When we went live, we thought, you know what? Data is great. Let's bring in all the data. So with Care Everywhere, we're like, whatever is available, let's bring it in. What we found was it was overwhelming. And we thought, we this is not sustainable. So we had found out that you can actually dial down how much data you're bringing in. So we dialed it down to the last 12 months of data for care everywhere. And then we found that even with Dr. First, that's actually more than we really needed. So we're bringing in just the last six months with Dr. First. So that kind of, that's that reach out of the past mm -hmm. medication history that the pharmacy techs or the nurses reconcile is looking back six months. But from a physician standpoint, if they want to look back even further, they can use the care everywhere or other historical records from beyond and with that integrated care everywhere network. That was one of the feedback, one of our lessons learned was- Yeah, I was going to ask you, what are your lessons yeah. learned? And do you have any insights or advice you want to share other healthcare leaders considering a consolidation yeah. and moving forward? Too much data is a real thing. So mm -hmm. it was overwhelming with just the amount of data we brought in. And so I would say that is something we probably, if I had known that we needed to dial down how much how many years worth of medication history were coming in that we probably would have done that from the very beginning the other thing that i think we would have liked to have done differently is the when you're converting you actually have to have a physical transcription person like someone actually reconcile the meds into the patient's new chart so you have either care everywhere or doctor for some solution out there doing the medication history but then for that first time that patient arrives for that medication list to be populated as these are my home medications, it requires someone to actually click on that plus sign and then reconcile those meds. There are some AI solutions out there. We didn't go live with that. And I realize that's probably something I wish we had maybe done initially is gone live with that. And then had this person work off of the AI solution instead of this whole mass of medication so after a few months, we realized this medica the medication reconciliation process was so onerous to our primary care docs in particular. So we started working with um, Dr. First and some other solutions to bring in this kind of this better medication history for our primary care docs to do the reconciliation so that, again, as your patients are being seen for the first time, their medication list is already populated. I just love that. It's amazing that they had e-prescribing and then they and now they have this situation where it's like they can use AI on the, all of this data for reconciliation. It's so much help to the people yeah. trying to serve the patients. And I just think as a patient and caregiver, my experience is I don't remember all of the meds the names in particular, it's like, oh, I'll use right. it for this, I use it for that. And I'm a good patient. So I'm sure that's helpful for that as well. And that it is. It is. saying that. 
Mm -hmm. I, I think the other opportunity that we have is that we had a process in our prior system with Cerner where the pharmacy techs were notified ahead of time before, again, I'm a hospitalist. So as I go and do the admissions, that the medication history was usually a majority of the times already done that we lost that in Epic. And so now that we're past live, we've optimized the system. Technically, everything's working pretty well. Let's look at our workflows and processes. That's really what we're working on now. So we're working closely with our pharmacists and our nursing leaders to figure out how best can we make sure that medication history is done earlier in the process so that it's already done by the time the hospitalist sees the patients so that we can ensure that the medications are fully reconciled at, at the time of the visit. Mm, I love that. I love that. And so forward thinking. So now yeah. I want to dive into you as a leader. You, Stacey sure. Johnston, tell me, are you? do you have any habits that you have in your personal life that help you work your best and make a difference? Obviously, a very stressful situation you've walked into. Yeah, <laughs> and you're able yeah. to not only manage that so successfully and but you got to keep yourself going. So what are things that you do to keep yourself going and moving and growing as a yeah. leader? It takes a village. Obviously, I am just one person. And throughout this Im implementation and post-implementation, I couldn't have done it without the team that we have. I have amazing directors that report to me and amazing managers that report to them. We literally hand-selected the team that we have here. And so I call them the rock star team. And I feel like a mom sometimes when I walk into our team meetings and I'm like, I'm so proud of you all. You all, we got the epic 10 gold stars at 11 months after go live. So it's just like amazing, just amazing work done by the team. But I couldn't have also done it without the partnership with our CMIO and our chief technology officer, the CIO, our clinical leaders. So this really was a team coming together. And I think having a really good working relationship is really important so that you have, it's hard work and can it be stressful? Yes, obviously, but it can also be fun. So adding that element of fun to work. I take the team, we break them up into their applications. We go out to lunch. And so we rotate through who I go out to lunch with. I bring, we have donuts with Dr. J. So the managers and I get to sit around and chat once a month and we just have donuts together and just talk about whether it's work-related, not work-related. And so I just really, what gets me going through the day is just that teamwork. Just being part of something that is so special is amazing. Mm -hmm. And again, I couldn't have done it without them. Baptist, we couldn't have done it without them. But what keeps us continuing on a year and a half later is the fact that we have such a cohesive team that we really do have a lot of fun together. We are going bowling next weekend or next week together as a team. And you know, having that balance between kind of that work hard, played hard. And then of course at home, I have an amazing family. I've got a very supportive husband that allowed me to put my career ahead of his, which is amazing. And so I have uh, three kids, twin girls, and then a little boy. And in our free time, we do a ton of travel. I just got off the Icon of the Seas, which was just amazing. And we're going to Europe this summer. So it just, so that's what I b truly believe in you only live once and let philosophy of work hard, play hard. So I work really hard, but I also play really hard and just always on the go and taking my kids to Disney. And this weekend we're flying up to go see the solar eclipse because why not? Oh, yeah. So it's just, it, yeah. So I just, that's what keeps me going is just knowing that I, I just enjoy the working with the people so much that I work with. And then I enjoy coming home and being with my family and, and making the most of our time together. You have such a positive energy and light about you and optimism. How do you keep that optimism as challenges and obstacles come your way in life? What is something that keeps you resilient? Interestingly enough, my leadership, when you take that leadership assessment, that personality assessment, I scored amazingly high in resiliency. <laughs> and I think part of it is being a physician. You got to be resilient and just get through residency and medical school. But I also learned that it also can be a negative because not everyone is as resilient. And sometimes when things were going crazy during the implementation, I'd say, it's going to be okay. And one of the doctors would always say, but it's not. And I'm like, I promise you, it's going to be. And I think it's just realizing at the end of the day, it's going to be okay. No matter what happens, we're going to be fine. 
mistakes are going to be made, but you learn from them and you build upon it. And then you realize, okay, let's not do that again next time. And being forgiving of others as well as being forgiving of yourself is really just the only way, best way to get through life. That is so inspirational, Stacey. I appreciate that so much. So to finish off the conversation right, where can our listeners find you online? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. Just reach out to me. I always message back people and I just, I like to grow the LinkedIn network and, and we go to conferences and I'm part, I'm head up the, um, on the Ahada board. That's one of the Chime associations. And I often go to the Chime events and any conference, if I'm there, I would be happy to meet up with you as well too. Thank you so much. That's terrific. Now, before I forget, did you happen to bring tea with you today? I did. So I brought a peppermint tea and I don't have a very special mug, but I actually have a special mug in the cabinet, which I should have brought. But that one is from uh, the Boston Tea Party, oh. the, re- the reenactment place. So it's they, they have up in Boston, they have a Boston Tea Party ship. And my great whatever grandfather, Samuel Hammond, was a uh, part of the Boston Tea Party. So we were invited back for the Boston Tea Party 250th celebration, which is actually this oh winter. Oh my goodness! I'm not sure that I want to go to Boston in December because it's pretty <laughs> chilly, chilly out there. So anyway, so that's uh, so that's my tea story. Oh, I love that tea story. I'm in Boston, so I especially love Boston Tea Party story. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Stacy, and thank you for joining us today. We just love learning from you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And thanks to you folks for joining us too. Check out the High Tea with Grace podcast website and more great guests for more great guests like Stacy today. Cheers. Like a Girl Media is more than a media network. It's a community. We want to meet you and amplify your voice and the voices of outstanding women innovating in healthcare. Interested in starting your own podcast or hosting an event near you? Connect with us online or in person. We're here to support and empower you.